Hello, dear listeners. Uh, welcome to Bridging Voices, the video podcast of the Konrad Arnauer Stiftung's Multinational Development Policy Dialogue here in Brussels. My name is Jan Leino. I am Program Manager for Foreign and Security Policy. And I'm very pleased uh, to host today Ms. Emanuela uh, Claudia Del Rey, who is the European Union Special Representative for the Sahel, previously Deputy Foreign Minister of Italy, as well as a renowned academic uh, in her field with extensive experience also from conflict regions. Thank you for coming today, Emanuela. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be with you. I would like to start uh, the discussion on the security situation in Sahel just with a little bit on a scene setting here. You've been a couple of years now the special representative uh, to the Sahel. What was the reason? Why did you like to engage with this region? Why did you become the USR? I have been engaged in this region for a long time for a number of reasons in different positions as well. Um, recently, as the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Italy, of course, I engaged very much in the region because Italy is particularly engaged in the region. We, you already touched about it. Um, you said it's a very challenging security situation currently there. Could you maybe formulate the, what's the main challenges currently in the region? The Sahel, unfortunately, is afflicted by uh, several challenges, uh, starting from terrorism to food security to climate change that, uh, unfortunately, is one of the causes of a huge number of uh, displaced people and many other uh, important uh, challenges that, con considering the situation which is already very difficult for the, mm, the conditions of the territory and also the conditions of the population, obviously creates a climate in which it is very difficult to intervene in a, in a very um, effective way unless uh, there is a proper strategy and this is why the European Union for instance has defined its integrated strategy for the Sahel in 2021 to be sure that we can uh, address all the problems starting from security but also concentrating very much on development and in particular on humanitarian uh, aid which is at the moment uh, the most important uh, element for us of intervention because the emergency is uh, incredibly serious and and it becomes uh, even more serious every day. And I talk about, as I said, the, the needs of the population, which is a population that is particularly suffering at the moment for the reasons I mentioned in synthesis. You, you mentioned already the different aspects, the security aspects, development aspects, uh, humanitarian uh, situation on the ground. Um, the European Union has several missions uh, on the ground, both civilian and military missions. Could you a little bit characterize what are the missions and what are the main uh, goals? What do they uh, aim to achieve? When uh, we look at the region, sometimes we don't have the, the uh, an image of uh, a region where many things are happening. In reality, the region is very crowded. Many things are happening, luckily enough, because I just said that, that the region really needs a lot of attention. And uh, therefore, if we just look at the activities of the European Union, we come to realize that there are very many in many sectors. Uh, they are multi-dimensional, multi-level, with uh, the involvement of many uh, member states. We have... Uh, for instance, uh, missions that have been uh, ongoing for a long time, EUTM, which is the European Union Training Mission in Mali, for instance, which is unfortunately now suspended, but has it has trained uh, more than 18,000 uh, Malian soldiers over the years. Uh, the same, I could say, about EUCAP uh, Mali, which is the capacity building mission of the European Union in Mali, which is present also in uh, Niger. There are many other uh, exercises that are particularly relevant and are now uh, undergoing a certain transformation. For instance, we are inaugurating in the next few days a new uh, European Union training mission in Niger, which is uh, going to be mm, central to the region for what uh, comes to uh, military training and also training in human rights. So as you can see, mm, I could go on uh, with a long list, but just to make it brief, I can say that in reality we are really very present, not to mention the huge patrimony of uh, uh, projects that we have in the, f in the domain of development, which cover everything from health to education to agriculture to help for women, uh, the youth, 
In fact, as I said, despite the fact that we feel that uh, security is uh, really making a, a big condition on all that we do, in reality we are very present and things are ongoing with a huge uh, engine of uh, will, especially also uh, from the member states, political will as well as concrete will that really can make the difference for the future of uh, this uh, difficult uh, region. You mentioned the, the AILCAP mission uh, missions and, and as well as the training missions and the new missions in Niger, these are still focused more on training aspects, whereas looking at some other European Union member states, for example, France had more active uh, missions on the ground. How do you see this? Uh, is, is the training enough to challenge, uh, to, to, uh, to help the countries tackle the security uh, problems that they face? There is an ongoing discussion on uh, uh, the methodology that we have to apply to help the countries. And I have to say that also um, through myself, because this is my role, our dialogue with the leadership in each of the five countries of the Sahel is very intense. And we try to identify the real uh, issues, the real needs, and we discuss uh, all, all of this with our partners because don't forget that we call the countries of the Sahel partners. And also, of course, we discuss it within the 27 member states of the European Union because we have to take decisions all together. Uh, in the end, I can say that, yes, uh, we are very well aware of the fact that we need to continue to be by the side of the population, and this is why we always respond with humanitarian aid. But we also know that there is a strong pressure from the countries of the Sahel to get help in terms of military support and also in terms of uh, uh, concrete uh, instruments to, uh, to, to help their fight against uh, security threats. We are discussing these things. For instance, there is a mission, technical mission, that is going to Burkina Faso at the moment. There are also other activities, dialogue, uh, discussions. We are providing a, a lot of equipment, for instance, military equipment, which is uh, uh, absolutely essential. But we are also trying to follow uh, a certain principle, which is the principle of ownership, by which we, we would like, and the countries themselves would like, to be able to uh, manage their own problems by themselves. So for us, the principle is to accompany the process, uh, not, not to impose or not to uh, be uh, the, 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 uh, the only um, executors of, of, the, the, of the processes. So it is a delicate issue, but we are uh, discussing these things. And in terms of what we are doing, we are already doing a lot. But of course, uh, the threats are uh, increasing. And therefore, we will have to adjust our, our response to the needs that come from the countries of the Sahel in an adequate way. You already mentioned uh, that there are several actors um, in the region. As we're located and we do this uh, interview in Brussels, uh, months and a year now, uh, the, the crisis in Ukraine or the Russian aggression in Ukraine has been the main topic um, in Brussels. Um, how has this crisis manifested itself, talking about the security sector now uh, in the Sahel? I have to say that this is a question that uh, the Sahelians ask me all the time. Uh, are you changing your uh, approach to the Sahel uh, given the crisis in Ukraine? My answer is no, we are not changing our approach. We are continuing to invest the same amount of money that has already been allocated. We are continuing the, our dialogue with you, our cooperation, and we are trying to find the adequate responses to your needs and to, you, to your requests. The real problem is that uh, we also have a political level in this sense. We know very well that it is important for us to, uh, to express our opinion and to, to bring our arg uh, arguments to make the countries of the Sahel understand that the war in Ukraine is not a question of uh, uh, that relates only to the European Union, is a question of global order. We know that uh, the effects of the war in Ukraine also in the Sahel have been very serious. For instance, increase in the inflation, in um, difficulty to get um, cereals and grain. Uh, there have been a lot of consequences 
in terms of uh, um, food security and uh, affecting the population, of course. So you can imagine how serious the, the, the impact of this uh, war is on, on the Sahel. And also, as you very, very, you very well know, there is a campaign of Russia to uh, convince the countries of the Sahel that their model is the, pro the, 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 the most uh, profitable one. And also uh, the fact that Mali, for instance, accepted the presence of the um, group um, of Wagner on its territory, which has really caused uh, serious uh, consequences because we were obliged, given that this was a red line for the European Union, to interrupt our support to the country in terms of uh, our military missions and uh, military support. So as you can see, this is a very serious issue. The most important thing is that our narrative must be strong enough to make them understand. Not everybody is understanding the importance of this uh, war and its impact at global level. And uh, of course, uh, this is our task, difficult task, to uh, make uh, all the countries aware and to work with them to find a new um, balance in, uh, of, of power, especially in the region and in the, with, with the European Union. You mentioned your arguments as well, that uh, your, your message to the Sahelian leaders is, is clear. Um, I would like to turn the table um, other way around, because as you know, many countries have been directly in infected, uh, Poland, for example, as one country neighboring Ukraine by the war. What is your message to the representatives of these countries who might have strong opinions about the Russian involvement in the Sahel and so on? What, what do you tell the, the representatives of these countries? We cooperate very closely, of course, uh, with uh, every country of the European Union. And uh, what I would like to say, which is very important, never in history there has been so much attention by the, all the 27 member states of the European Union towards the, the Sahel as there is now. I, at the beginning of my position, when I started in uh, July 2021, I was uh, uh, somehow surprised to see how engaged were the, Bal the Baltic states and how engaged were the uh, Eastern European countries that I actually know very well. And uh, then, of course, looking at their perspective, it's understandable. It's very important for them to be present because the issue of Russia was already there uh, before the, the, the war in Ukraine. But also the fact that, that the, the, the Sahel is, as I always say, the real southern border of Europe. And nobody uh, more than the Baltic states or the uh, Eastern European states can understand how important it is to be present and to bring uh, a particularly positive model of democracy to work on with the countries of the Sahel who want actually um, societies based on so state of law, access to basic services, welfare state, in contrast with other projects and proposals that do not take into account this, but just uh, the uh, exploitation of resources and no development at all. So I am grateful to the countries of the Eastern of Eastern Europe and especially uh, also to the, the to the Baltic states and all the states that actually bring their own important perspective to this discourse for the Sahel because their contribution is absolutely fundamental. And as I said, I really very much appreciate their, their engagement. You mentioned uh, the Baltic states and Eastern European countries as, uh, as a good example, and, and like you know, the, the, the Baltic states were also taking part in the Cuba, the, the special mission um, uh, in the Sahel. I would like to do, turn a little bit still back on the uh, on the Wagner point, which you mentioned earlier. As we know now, also the European Parliament uh, published in its really yearly review of the common security and defense policy. Um, a list of countries which uh, employ Wagner soldiers. Mali was mentioned there as well. Uh, Qatar was mentioned there. And, and there's also been talks about Burkina Faso and so on. Um, as a result of this, you could say that some of the countries have been more hesitant. We see that the Czech Republic has pulled uh, its troops from the UTM Mali training mission. Uh, we see also that they closed their embassy. Of course, maybe you can say that the Czech Republic is not otherwise so involved. How do we re-engage in this, specifically talking about Mali now, or, or the countries where Wagner is, uh, is present, how do we re-engage with this region so that we don't leave it to the Russians? I would say that we never stopped being engaged, and this is good news for all of us. Uh, it, in my job, which is quite challenging, as you can understand, I always concentrate very much on uh, keeping 
the European Union member states uh, focused on the Sahel and engaged on the Sahel, and also the countries of the Sahel oriented towards the European Union. And uh, this is um, a tough uh, task, of course, but I have to say that in terms of engagement, um, recently in the month of January, there were many discussions within the European Union, and no, there is no one single country that doubts that we need to be engaged in the, in the Sahel for a number of reasons. Also because uh, there is a, a risk of spillover towards the coastal states, for instance, in the Gulf of Guinea. There, is, there are many effects to the north in the Maghreb, uh, the effect that obviously um, come from uh, the reinforcement of uh, terrorism in territories that is difficult to control by the part of the countries of the Sahel. So you can imagine how much it is necessary to keep engaged. So I would, I would, I would say that what is happening now, also because of the war in Ukraine, is a, a sort of a redefinition of our engagement to make it more effective and especially to make our partnership with the countries of the Sahel uh, more solid for the future, able to uh, resist to the, to the threats which are really particularly serious. And I just want to make a simple sentences by saying the, the epicenter of all the phenomena, the negative phenomena in, in, uh, in the region and uh, the phenomena that have an effect on the European Union is in the Sahel. This is why, of course, we can never abandon the region. What, we, what do we do? We keep to the dialogue ongoing. We keep uh, the, always the open door. We, I must say, we have a, a real, uh, let's say, uh, rich and uh, uh, frequent dialogue with the countries of the Sahel. I myself, I go there all the time and I speak to everybody. And also, as regards Mali, our uh, approach was, since the beginning of the crisis with the, with the country, was to uh, keep our principles, for instance, no Wagner, which is a red line for us, but at the same time, keeping an open door because it's important uh, to uh, see whether we can uh, uh, make uh, Mali come out of the, the isolation in which it is actually confining itself. So as, as you can see, it's a lot of activities, and uh, I think this is the only way by which we can obtain good results. Go back on the, the point you just mentioned, um, the, the red line. Uh, I see that uh, in an in a interview for the Deutsche Welle, you, you said that... Uh, Quote, I have always promoted the formula firmness without closure, which means that we must be really firm on fundamental uh, principles. Could you please uh, a bit uh, elaborate what would be for you red lines, what which these countries should not go over? We um, are very clear on that. Uh, as you probably know, the, our um, integrated strategies for the Sahel is uh, based on a political um, inspiring uh, principle, which is governance. I think it's the most important in the sense that we, th we really believe that uh, if, if it were possible to have uh, good governance in the Sahel, many of the um, challenges that the countries are facing now would uh, uh, be tackled or uh, uh, at least uh, changed into opportunities. Of course it is not easy and uh, this is why we contribute with all our means to uh, electoral processes and uh, other uh, activities that are um, going in this direction in trying to re-establish uh, uh, constitutional order and uh, governance. Red lines for us uh, are, uh, you know, respect of human rights and uh, of course uh, uh, he uh, helping the population of course, we want constitutional order, considering that in, in the region we have two countries where there have been uh, coup d'etat, and uh, one country which is in transition after, let's say, a succession of the president who died and was, was uh, substituted by his son. So these transitions uh, for us are very serious, and we would really like the transitions, especially the roadmap and uh, you know the, the chronogram of the transition to be respected. This is another red line in the sense that we want to see uh, elections and the return to constitutional order happen to make sure that governance is possible. Um, you mentioned red, red lines. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the keyword governance, um, electoral process, constitutional. Um, order. Now, one might look at the map and say that these countries are not uh, picture-builds of democracies, uh, which are currently, uh, which are in, in, 
in uh, in the Sahel. I also looked up the number that um, the European Union, for example, alone to Mali uh, has provided 472 million euros in, in humanitarian aid since 2012, where the uh, where the security situa- uh, situation worsened. We have seen in, in other European Union uh, partner countries, including Ethiopia, with the Tigray crisis, that the European Union has measures that they can implement uh, if they partners cross the so-called red lines, but you just uh, defined. Currently, the European Union has implemented, for example, in Mali, travel restrictions and asset freezes. What would be the next step in order that if there's more crossing of the red line, what would be the next step that the European Union would do? Slash other way asked, what should the Malian government do that this don't happen? We are not alone in the Sahel because, uh, as you very well know, there are big organizations that are uh, devoted to the political uh, processes in the region. For instance, ECOWAS, which is the uh, economic um, community of uh, the countries of of Western Africa. ECOWAS for us is a very important organization. The European Union, since the beginning of the crisis in Mali, um, really decided to, to, uh, let's say, try to uh, uh, accompany the the, the decisions of uh, ECOWAS, um, considering that we, uh, according to the principle of uh, ownership, would like the countries of of Western Africa to take the decisions by themselves. So when the crisis started, we waited for ECOWAS to take decisions and we um, somehow supported the, the, the decisions. So when I say we are not alone, there are many things ongoing in the region. Uh, and this is very important because this means that there is a lot of uh, discussion, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, political engagement and uh, it is necessary because if we want to obtain some good results for the future, this is the only way. Regarding Mali, of course, uh, the red line was Wagner. Wagner was instead, unfortunately, uh, employed by the, the government of Mali um, uh, together with many other events uh, that, that have uh, taken place which have somehow um, worsened the situation and also our ability to have an open dialogue uh, which would lead to solutions of problems. At the moment, the situation is a bit stagnating. Nevertheless, we continue the dialogue. Uh, there, are, there have been many events. Um, for instance, recently there was a big event at the Security Council in New York in which the mission of the, U- the, uh, of the United Nations MINUSMA was discussed and uh, the, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Mali was present, as well as in many other occasions in which we have the opportunity to have a dialogue with Mali. Certainly, they are making choices that are difficult for us to accept. For instance, recently they voted against the resolution which was proposed on the first year and anniversary, uh, said anniversary of the war in Ukraine, and they were uh, amongst the uh, seven countries that voted against the resolution, which obviously uh, is a signal of uh, their will to position themselves outside the, the global debate. And this is uh, what I would like to tell them in the sense that uh, it is not a matter of uh, voting yes or no. It's a uh, where you want to position yourself in this moment in which the global order is redesigning uh, and therefore you know to put yourself in a club of seven together with Syria, with, uh, with uh, North Korea, uh, means that you are making a choice that is going to have an effect on your populations. And especially if we talk about democracy, I always mm, co- try to correct this, uh, uh, this kind of approach because I don't think that we can uh, transpose our model to other countries. I think that we have to talk about contextual democracy in the sense that the, the, the countries uh, can interpret this concept by themselves. But of course what we can do, because we are partners, and I repeat this, we are partners, meaning we share uh, the destiny uh, of, uh, of our generations, new generations, what we can do, we can accompany the processes and make sure that the, the, the kind of democracy they want, which uh, has to be based of course on uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other things that we all share at global level, of course we can accompany the processes and make sure that they develop the model that can allow the populations to develop and prosper and especially for instance just to make it clear to our listeners to allow individuals to realize themselves. 
this is something that for us it's uh, obvious, you know, going to school and uh, having protection at health level and so on. In these countries, this is absolutely uh, impossible. And uh, therefore, you know, um, with our work, uh, the European Union, uh, we, we would like to be able to contribute to, to this kind of uh, uh, new asset in, uh, in, in societies in the Sahel. Thank you. For, I'd like to go uh, still, we have a couple of minutes left, um, into the section called Lessons Learned. You have been now, since you mentioned uh, 21, the uh, special representative uh, to, for the Sahel from the European Union. If you look back uh, now, the past two years, a lot, of ha- a lot has happened. Russia has gained influence. Uh, Europe has uh, put also sanctions on. What would you have done differently? What would you wish that the European Union would have done differently or realized earlier? I always look at the future because I spent all my life in conflict areas. If I were not optimistic and I were, were not always looking at the future, I would have been stuck probably and not been producing ideas as I still do, luckily enough, and now. Uh, therefore, what I can say, uh, lessons learned in the sense of what we can do now. What we can do now is to adapt our language because now there is a fight over narrative which is very serious. No, it is not by chance that we always talk about uh, the huge effect of uh, the disinformation campaign of Russia, for instance, which is not only Russia, unfortunately. Now it's also other, other big actors that are using this kind of uh, uh, tool of warfare. And therefore we have to develop a proper narrative that really reunited, uh, reunites us to the population of the Sahel. We are the same population. This is the, the principle on which we should build our future. We are the same population. Uh, we will be even more uh, united in the future given the, the demographic, uh, demographic growth of uh, Africa, which will made us, uh, m- make us really a, a one, only one population, big population. And as I said, this population will be Euro-African or African-European, as, as we want to say. And this is why this is probably the lesson learned that we have to apply in the future. Speak the same language, develop this kind of understanding that is still developing now. I know that we have so many, so many things in common that we can develop it. But at the same time, we know that something in the past sometimes was not clear enough. We were not able to express ourselves and to make us ourselves understood. And we are still applying certain probably cultural schemes of the past that sometimes are difficult to uh, put in place in terms of diplomacy and uh, negotiations. I know that we are able to, to speak the same language and uh, I really count on the Europeans and on the Africans to develop this common language. I always say we need to develop a European African language or African European language because this is the moment to do so and we have to be be prepared for the future. This is the only way by which we can uh, contrast uh, uh, negative influences that don't, do not have any, uh, n- any intention of really doing good for the future, but only uh, the idea of exploiting resources and uh, dividing populations. This is the moment to, to act in this sense. What are for you the, the means how to do that? One is, of course, to have the narrative. The second would be then that people also understand it and, and, and hear it and promote it. We all speak a lot about the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, for example, which focuses on infrastructure. There is a new global security initiative uh, proposed by Beijing. Russia, like you mentioned and we talked about earlier, is using mercenaries, the Wagner Group, for, for pushing its uh, own agenda or worldview. The European Union has reacted to this on different kind of team of team Europe uh, approaches or, or the infrastructure program called Global Gateway. What should happen there so that the narrative also comes to the people uh, in the Sahel region? We are not in competition with these uh, actors. So we are the European Union. We are the main partner of each of the countries of the Sahel. This means a lot. The main partner, meaning we are the ones who give more money. The, the ones who have expressed the more political will, the ones who have been by the side of the population more, considering all the emergencies that there are with our humanitarian aid. So we are not in competition. We have to reinforce our ability to be by the side of the population, becoming part of that uh, pro- cultural process that is developing in the countries of the side. It's not easy, but we are starting to do so. 
also because we have so many instruments and so many people who work for the European Union and with the European Union at multilateral level and bilateral level. Don't forget that there are 27 member states that travel through the region, have embassies, uh, put in place development projects. So we are really a reference point for the countries of the Sahel. They do not deny that. In fact, they always repeat it and they are grateful. And we are also grateful to them for choosing us as main partners, because for us it's also a way of building our future, which is in need of uh, having partners from, uh, from the African continent, because as you know, the African continent is really going to plays an important role in the future. So I, I really think that this is the only way by which we can uh, build a, a proper uh, system, uh, because uh, we, we must not forget that while we do you know, very practical things, which means money and projects, at the same time we have to build a solid understanding between us. I think it is possible. Not easy, not easy, but possible. Building a solid uh, understanding between us two and leveraging that, what we have, like you mentioned, uh, the European Union is the main partner with uh, most of the financial means also for this region. It has been a pleasure to discuss with you, European Union Special Representative for the Sahel, Emanuela Dere. Thank you very much for taking the time to be today with us. Uh, we're looking forward to engaging with you in the future. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And uh, also I want to thank you for focusing on the Sahel because uh, despite it's not always on the front page of the, of the journals, in reality is uh, probably the most important uh, dossier on the table of the European Union at the moment, of course, after Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.